our ghosts trying to beat the heat this summer. And we wrap up Cryptid Week with a look at a local legend with the body count today on Dead Rabbit Radio. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Dead Rabbit Radio. I'm your host, Jason Carpenter. I'm having a great day. I hope you're having a great day too. So we've been experiencing some technical difficulties on our side here. You'll notice that today we're wrapping up Cryptid Week. It's a little late. This file actually got deleted. This is my fourth time recording this episode. We did release the Golf Rumors episode on Friday. That's proved to be immensely popular. So everyone who's downloaded that, listened to that, and even sent me emails. I've gotten a lot of emails about that. Thank you for that. Thanks for paying attention to the show. So we're going to go ahead and wrap up Cryptid Week, though. Now, one thing I did want to talk about during Cryptid Week was my own cryptid. So, you know, I've talked before about how I'm an author, a writer, better way to put it. And I love watching uh, sci-fi channel movies, watch a lot of those monster movies, Three-Headed Shark Attack, Five-Headed Shark Attack, Ghost Shark. That was good. I like that one. I tried watching Santa Jaws the other day, um, but the other people I was with weren't that into it, so I had to shut it off. We ended up watching The Nest instead about killer cockroaches. That's not a sci-fi channel movie, but it's incredibly disgusting. Check it out. The Nest. It's from the late 80s. But anyway, so I watched a lot of those monster movies. I actually started to write my own monster movie for sci-fi channel. Croco Mile. It's about a mile on crocodile. I think it's a great idea. This crocodile, this alien satellite crashes into Earth. It starts to infest this crocodile, and, and every time he eats, he gets bigger and bigger and bigger, till, of course, spoiler alert, he becomes a mile long, and the good guys have to drive a jeep into his mouth to drop it. Because you figure a, a mile long crocodile, it's getting big. It's not just like a snake. It's getting big all over. It's like Godzilla size at that point. I don't even think Godzilla's a mile tall. Anyways, they drive a jeep into its mouth, and they're like setting bombs, and there's like a fist fight on the edge of its stomach acid, because the bad guy got swallowed earlier. And then there was the evil general who the whole movie, he's talking about how much how much he hated mosquitoes. And then a mosquito gets giant and like sucks all of his blood out. They had a, I had a character named Crossbow Jones. He was a mercenary was with an attitude and a specialized crossbow that had different explosives on it. He wasn't the star, though. He was kind of like the, the second in command. But it was this team of mercs that had teamed up each of their own. They were all with different military units and they had all faced the crocodile at different stages in its growth. And they all are telling these stories. They're like, yeah, man, I, me and my men, we fought this crocodile. He was like 50 feet tall and he just decimated us. And then the female commander was like, when we faced the crocodile, it was 80 feet tall. And the other guy's like, you know, when we fought it, it was 120 feet tall. So they kind of learn early on this thing's growing exponentially. So they all have to team up, even though they're with different nations, to try to take this down. And, of course, you have the bikini-wearing co-ed to kind of be the everyman in the story, plus to have a bikini-wearing co-ed in a horror movie, because you want those. Who who doesn't want those? I want those. I think every movie should star a bikini girl. I actually watched a movie called... I think it it was The Stepfather, and whoever wrote it was a genius, because the main star, the boy, was a swimmer, and it was summertime, so it gave the excuse for his girlfriend to wear a bikini the whole movie and sit by the pool. And I was like, this is genius. Like, whoever came up with this idea knew exactly the audience for this movie. With that being said, Croco Mile. Sci-Fi Channel, hit me up. Forget all those sexist comments I just made. <laughs> and if you want to work with a podcaster on an amazing movie, now that Sharknado's wrapping up, hit me up. DeadRabbitRadio at gmail.com if you want to see my script. It's ready to go. It's ready to go for you. I haven't submitted it out. But I've, I have written other horror movie scripts that I've submitted out to other various production companies. And they like the pitch, but no one's ever actually bought the script. So maybe there's a... I don't know. I don't know. I still send them out, though. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started here. So the first thing we're going to talk about is there is a British paranormal... Actually, let me back up here because the headline is very important. So this was in The Sun, one of Britain's magazines. Again, a brilliant headline. I gotta love these these headlines. This is about paranormal activity raising, being more heightened during the heat wave, the current heat wave that's going on. The headline of the article: Who you gonna cool? Who who you gonna cool? I mean, you know, I you gotta tap your hat. You gotta tip your hat to these reporters and the editor, these editors who are coming out with these catchy headlines. 
I think it's becoming a lost art. You have to give props to these old school headlines because now all of the headlines are so clickbaity. And the headlines tell us what opinion to feel when you're reading the article and why it's awful and why it's beautiful and why it's great and why it's important. Let me decide. But all the headlines nowadays are becoming clickbaity. Who are you going to cool? That's a great headline. So tip, hats off to you, son. However, I do have to deduct points for writing the article in the first place. So basically, this is the premise of this article, that because of the heat wave, there has been an unexplained spike in ghost sightings, according to this ghost hunter. So this ghost hunter is professional paranormal investigator Gary Parsons said that ghostly apparitions have been summoned by the scorching sun. And he's like, I don't know why. He goes, I have this device that we've invented that can pick up ghost noises, and we're seeing a lot of more ghosts. So here's one of his quotes. We have received a major spike in the number of calls during June and July, with people reporting scary supernatural phenomenon. Why? What? What? Why are you defining it as scary? Like, yes, ghosts by their general nature, is scary. But you never hear a physicist being like, black holes are super spooky. Like, just be like, yeah, you don't have to throw scary and spooky and, and all, all sorts of stuff. He does that a couple times in here. I think he uses the word haunting at one point. Oh, he later on he goes, it, 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 he's talking about this box he made. So, of course, they're selling it. He says, it is, it is designed to search out unexplained orb lights, eerie voices, and deadly spirits. Just, uh, come on, man. You're not, you're not doing your profession any good when you have to use adjectives like that. It's hard to take you seriously when you use words like spooky and eerie. So he's saying that ghostly activity is spiking during the summer. He doesn't know why, but they're being, in his words, summoned by the scorching sun. This is one of my issues with ghost researchers is that it's all it's all guesswork it's all guesswork why any of this stuff happens if you were a ghost why would you most likely come out during a heat wave as opposed like let's say where actually here's a better question where do ghosts go when they're not ghosting where are the paranormal I mean, so you assume they're not in heaven or hell because they would stay there so what actually are ghosts doing when they're not walking down your hallway do they exist do they go off to some, like, ghost resort? Is it, like, super cold there right now? And that's why they're coming out to the sun now? These are quite, and you know, actually, I never thought about that. These are kind of legitimate questions you have to ask people. Where do ghosts go when they're not walking down your hallway? Or having spooky conversations with you? Or standing in the mirror? Where are they? I don't know, I, because I've actually never even thought about that before. I've always wondered, though, why ghosts wear clothes. and White ghosts wear clothes that they didn't necessarily die in. Most people die in their underwear or naked. So why are Victorian ghosts wearing these like beautiful ball gowns and stuff like that? Why aren't there more naked ghosts? Why aren't more ghosts wearing boxers with holes in them and like a, a Walmart, you know, I, a Walmart journey shirt? Because that's how most people die. Most people don't die in a neatly pressed Civil War uniform. Yeah, of course. Okay, maybe that's a bad example because a lot of people did die in Civil War uniforms. But not everyone died in their Victorian costume or their regal clothes. So, I, I do you die? Do you haunt in the clothes you're most familiar with? Like, if I saw the ghost of, like, an old gothic dude, would he be wearing his trench coat and, like, 10-inch heel boots or those thick soles with all the spikes? Or would he be wearing his... You know, white tank top and no no shorts because he died on the toilet. We need to, these are, to me, those are more questions that we need answers to rather than is the sun summoning ghosts. But anyways, if you know the answers to any of those questions, hit me up. Because I don't. I don't. Why do ghosts wear, why do ghosts wear clothes at all? Anyways, where do ghosts go when they're not haunting? So anyways... Uh, and I have a logical explanation for this story. So he's saying that during June and July, ghost sightings are up. He's being called out to more locations. The author of the article says, you know, if you see a ghost, give us a call. And he's doing all these investigations during the summer. Now, the, I think kind of the typical idea is that ghosts come around at night. And really, like, the fall and the winter, for me, are like the scariest time for ghosts. I'm never like, oh, no, it's 90 degrees out and 
there's people windsurfing on the river. There might be a ghost tonight. Like there's certain elements of time where things get spookier. It gets darker earlier. All the trees look dead. Streets are quieter because you don't have all like the tourists. I live in a tourist town, but you know, there's a time period where things are quieter and creepier. And to me, I'm a little more on edge during fall and winter than I am during the spring and summer. I, I, the, the, I, okay, let's put it this way. If I'm out at the beach in my shorts and like an inner tube around my waist and a little like sunblock on my nose and basically look like a character from an 80s movie going to the beach and I saw a ghost on the beach, that's not scary. That's completely not scary. If it's sunny outside and I'm like, oh man, it's so hot and I'm like working in my garden and I look up and there's like a butler standing there, a ghost butler, not a real butler, a ghost butler standing in my garden, I'll be like, dude, grab a rake, bro. Like, it's hot out here, and I just want to get back inside as quickly as possible. There's a ghost blocking your air conditioner. You're like, God damn it. Get out of the way, man. It, it, it's not scary. It's not scary during the summer. The, and here's my here's my reasoning for why this article's coming out and why this guy's saying that it's been a spike in the summer. Summertime, people don't read as much. People don't listen to podcasts as much, honestly. People have a completely different set of activities during the summertime and you and and you you know there are people who read during the summer but generally when i was a writer you would see drop-offs during the summer months because people do stop buying the amount of volume of books they're out doing more things i think that's what's going on here he's realized oh crap it's the summer slump i'm not going to get as much business people aren't going to call me up to tell me that their aunt judy is floating around their kitchen or Maybe I'll start telling people that the summer sun is making ghosts appear. So he's basically just drumming up business. Now, I know you could be saying you have no proof of that and you're kind of disparaging them. And sure, probably. However, I mean, and not probably. Yeah, that's absolutely right. I have no proof of what I just said. However, just knowing the way that the economy works and sometimes you need to pay bills in the middle of the summer. Because here's the fact of the matter. The sun is not summoning spooky spirits to invade your cabana. That's just simply not happening. Not happening at all. So the idea that this guy has legit proof that the summer sun is summoning ghosts is just ridiculous on the face of it. It really, I mean, you could say that ghosts in general is ridiculous, but if you, okay, let's say that you were a haunting apparition who died brutally, or or you were just a haunting apparition who tripped down the stairs. The point of being a ghost is kind of to be scary, and there's nothing less scary than the noonday sun. And you could say, yeah, but it gets hot at night, too. But yeah, at that point, okay, imagine it's cold, and you're huddled in your living room, and you're reading a book, and you see, like, a little ghost girl, like, creeping around the corner. You're going to be freaked out. If it's 100 degrees, it's 100 degrees, and you're just sweating your balls off, and you're super irritated, and everything pisses you off because you can't get comfortable, you got four fans on you, the air conditioner's running top speed, and you're still sweating, you see a ghost girl crawl around the corner, you're not going to care. Because you're so, actually, you probably kick the shit out of it, because you're so irritated anyways. Absolutely irritated. And now you've got some creepy 12-year-old singing lullabies in your bedroom while you're trying to sleep, and you can't even sleep because you're covered in sweat. So I think if there are ghosts, and they are like spooky ghosts, as he's claiming, the last time they're going to show up is when you're already ready to, like, beat the crap out of somebody. They'll be like, oh, I'll come back later. I'll come back when he's totally comfortable and, like, falling asleep. And then I'm going to, like, crawl under his bed sheets and, like, just forget that. <laughs> forget that example, that particular example. You know what I'm saying. There's a time and a place for ghosts to scare you. And it's not during the summer. And if the ghost is just trying to communicate you, When's the worst time to talk to somebody? When they're sweating. If I'm sweating and my mom calls, I'm like, I'll call her back. I'm not talking to someone when I'm losing a liter of water a minute. So if my Aunt Judy wants to float back from the netherworld to warn me about the coming apocalypse, don't do it under the noonday sun. He's drumming up business. He's drumming up business to sell his box. He calls it the Huff Wonder Box, which again is a terrible name. If you put wonder in the... Okay, I've, I've trashed this dude enough. I've trashed this dude enough. Great headline, though. Great headline. Total nonsense. Okay, we're going to go ahead and move on to our next story. So, the Pope Lick Monster. Now, this is going to end off our cryptid week. The Pope Lick Monster is a local legend in Kentucky. He's called the Pope Lick Monster, not because he licks popes, but because he apparently haunts an area 
called the Pope Lick Creek in Kentucky. I don't know why it's called Pope Lick. I don't have no idea why the creek's called that. Anyways, probably because the Pope did get licked there, but it's probably bad timing for that joke. So, Pope Lick Monster is a creature who is half man, no, 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 sorry, part man, part goat, part sheep. Which is the worst animal to be a part of. I mean, outside of, like, a slug. It's probably one of the worst mammals to be part that. What does a sheep do? What supernatural abilities or what advantages would you have as a sheep? You're extra wooly? What do sheep do? They just get sheared. And they taste okay? Part sheep. If I was part sheep, I would be pissed. I would rather be a bloodthirsty like werewolf and have to deal with, you know, the constant struggle to eat humans because at least you could fight crime at that point. A part sheep, ridiculous. So, anyways, he's boy. Well, at least he's part goat and part goat's actually kind of lame too. You can't really run that fast. Your legs are all messed up. You have horns, I guess. I guess that's the trade off. Anyways, Pope Lick Monster is part man, part goat, and part sheep, and this is the legend. So back in the day, I think it was like the 1920s, early you know turn of the century. There was a very cruel ringmaster, circus dude, right? And he had this circus, obviously. And one day, there is a baby, a deformed baby, dropped off at the circus. I'm assuming, like, outside of the bearded lady's tent. And she's like, oh, my God, it's so beautiful, whatever. Anyway, so they get this, you can (laughs) tell... They get this little deformed baby, and they look at it, and they're like, oh, dude, this is part man, part goat, and part sheep. Because it's extra wooly. And so the circus ringmaster goes, oh, this will go perfect. Perfect in my freak show. This guy is like the ultimate freak. So he, what does he do? He immediately begins abusing the baby. Because he's a dick. Because the ringmaster is like a total jerk. So he's like beating up the baby and he abuses it. He abuses it for years and years and years. And here's my thought. If I found a mutant baby, let's say I was a circus freak. No, no, I'm not the circus freak. Let's say I'm a ringmaster. And I find a mutated baby. I, too, am going to say, this will go great in my freak show. But I'm not going to beat it up, and here's why. I'm going to take that little baby, and during the day, he's going to be in the freak show. And at night, I'm going to send him to adult learning classes. I'm going to send him to University of Phoenix online so he can help me with my finances. So he can actually, like, there's so much other stuff this ringmaster could have done with this mutant baby. Put him in the freak show, yes. But why not send him to business ma- business management school or just teach him how to, like, do architecture and build better tents? I don't understand why his default mode was to kick the shit out of this little baby. But he did, and he did it for years and years and years. And eventually, the Popelic monster, that wasn't his name back then. His name was probably, like, Harold. But anyways, this little freak is growing up. He becomes like a surly teenager. He's smoking cigarettes. And he starts to hate his ringmaster, as you would, because he got beat up. Again, if you sent him to, you know, a dirt adult learning annex, he wouldn't have hated you so much, ringmaster, but you beat him up every day. Now he's this super strong, he has the strength of a sheep, and they're coming across the Pope. So this was a traveling circus. The tr- circus is traveling across the Pope Lick Creek Bridge. It's storming out. And then a lightning strike hits the bridge. The train goes. If I actually had more time, I probably would edit in professional sound effects. But I don't. So that's what you get. A lightning bolt. Train. Bridge. Seagull. Bears seeing it all through the woods. Okay, anyways, anyway, the train crashes. The Popelik monster is now free of his cage. And he's like, ugh. So what does he do? He starts eating the dead. And everyone's like, oh, I'm so glad I'm not dead because that goat monster's totally eating that dude. Then he starts eating the living because, you know, why not? He's been abused all of his life. And then he finds the ringmaster and eats him. So that's the initial legend of the Popelik monster. There's other ones that it was a farmer who made a pact with satan and became a goat that's 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 i like the the circus one because it's just more there's more to it and it's also a little more believable than making a pact with satan and becoming a goat because a lot of people make pacts with satan they don't become goats it's very believable that a circus freak was misused and 
turned into some sort of monster. And we'll get into that a bit more. But anyways, so today the legend of the Pope Lick monster is that this part man, part goat, part sheep stalks that area. There's a couple things that will happen. One, if you're in, if you walk by any place that has darkness, he reaches out, grabs you, you're never seen again. Sometimes he carries an axe. And if you're walking across the bridge, the Pope Lick Creek Bridge, that's how kind of how you summon him. He'll appear with an axe and he'll chase you. And you have two choices. You can either get chopped up because he's really fast. He has the speed of a sheep. You, he can chop you up or you jump off the bridge and die because it's like a 60 foot drop. And there's, it's not, I don't believe that it's like a creek. So it's not like a river. It's not like you can jump in and then swim away like Jumanji or something. I don't know if they do that in Jumanji, but I never saw that movie. Either of them. But anyway, so the other one is that, and this one's a little more devious, is that he can imitate voices and he can hypnotize you. And the way he hypnotizes you is that he makes it so you don't hear the train coming. Now, again, you're on a bridge with a train track and you're saying, well, Jason, didn't the bridge blow up? And I said, yes, yes, it did. But they repaired it. Well, actually, no, I don't know if the bridge actually blew up. I think that's all just legend. But anyways, there is a working train track there. And if you're walking across it and the Popolic monster sees you, he can make it so you can't hear the train coming. Trains, one of the most notoriously loud land vehicles. You don't hear the train coming. You're on the middle of this bridge. You look up, there's a train 20 feet in front of you. It hits you, splatters you, you're dead. So people say don't go to that area. Now, obviously, that's a really entertaining local legend. Kids go across the train tracks. Teenagers are like, hey, man, let's go down to the Popolic monster's house and see if we can see how he's doing on his community college courses. The, um, it's trespassing. The train company, the people who run it are like, please don't walk on that bridge. It's super dangerous. It's an active train bridge. 20 to 25 trains cross it. A day is not a place for you to go hang out with the Goonies now, but people do. And this is where the idea that the Popolic monster actually has a body count because people have fallen off the bridge. Fair enough. People are going to fall off bridges or jump off bridges, but something more interesting happened recently. So there was this young couple who they were legend tripping, which is something I've talked about before. We talked about it during Ong's Hat episode. That's where you go to these places with these legends and with these hauntings, and you go around and, you know, take pictures and then do your own investigation. It's kind of like ghost hunting, but it's with not just ghosts, it's with all sort of local legends. I think it's fascinating. I used to do something like that in Sacramento. It's, you know, just go around and, oh, this is where that happened. This is where that happened. But... This young couple, they are on a trip around the East Coast, that area, and they say, hey, the girl's like, hey, let's go to the Pope Lick Creek because there's this legend of the Pope Lick Monster, and the boyfriend's like, yeah, that's okay, it's a little out of our way, but it's kind of what we're doing anyways, we're looking at these local legends, so they go out there, and they say, hey, well, we have to walk across the bridge to summon the Pope Lick Monster. So the boyfriend tells the cops, so you know where this is going, that him and his girlfriend are walking across the bridge. And he looks up, and there's a train coming at him. Didn't even hear it coming. Which, again, I live miles away from a train track. I can hear it. And it's kind of hard not to hear it while you're walking on the train track. But anyways, he says, we looked up. The train was on the bridge. It was near us. There was nowhere for us to go. So he leans off the bridge, and he wraps his arm around a girder and just leans back as far as he can. And the train, he's so close. The train is so narrow. The train actually clips his arm and scrapes his arm up. It doesn't, like, rip his arm off or anything, but cuts his arm up really badly. But as he's hanging on, he looks and he sees his girlfriend flying off of the train track. She couldn't get safe. The train hit her, and she fell to her death. Tragic. You know, it's tragic. He got cited for misdemeanor, trespassing. Again, just to tell people this is not safe, and she lost her life. And the legend continues. You know, you had this young couple up there that the train was coming and they didn't hear it. And the Pope Lick monster may have claimed another victim. Do I think that's likely? No, I, I don't know. Think the Pope Lick monster hypnotized them. But it is a weird part of that story that how she died was the same way that the legend has always been. That he can hypnotize you so you don't hear the train coming. One thing that I've always thought was interesting about these local legends is the, the train story itself is relatively true the beginning the actual legend that you could have this deformed baby that got loose from a circus or escaped an accident and was running around the woods of that area but once you start giving him magical powers and 
let's say that happened. Let's say in the 1920s, the circus freak kid got loose in the woods of that area. Let's say it had happened when he was maybe 20 in human years, not sheep years, and he gets loose. He would be like 90 today. He would be collecting Social Security. He would be watching like The Price is Right. Like at a certain point, the legend, and that's what's interesting, these legends never die. Like these characters never age. You think they could be like, yeah, back in the 50s, he was like totally tearing shit up out in the middle of Pope Lake. But the last time I saw him, he was sitting on a park bench playing chess with the Mothman. But the, what happens is they have to keep the legend going. So now he's this magical creature who can teleport in and out of darkness and he can hypnotize you and stuff like that. It's possible that a mutant was running around in the woods at the turn of the century and then he just fell down a hill and died or died because he was, you know, three different species mixed together and that was just too much mutation for your heart to handle. But the initial legend could have a hint of truth. The mind control stuff, not far, far less likely, but like I said, it's kind of creepy that they she died the way that he hunts. So, that is a local legend that possibly, possibly, actually has a body count. So that's it. We finally got through Cryptid Week. I really hope this episode sounds good because I can't record it a fifth time. We just, we're in a new environment. We're recording some things differently and all that. But I'm so glad you stuck around with us. I'm so glad you've been patient. DeadRabbitRadio at gmail.com is going to be our email address. And again, I appreciate all the emails I've gotten from you. I've gotten a lot. We have our... Facebook is facebook.com slash deadrabbitradio. Twitter as at Jason O. Carpenter. That's another way you can follow us. Dead Rabbit Radio is the daily paranormal conspiracy and true crime podcast. You don't have to listen to it every day, but I'm glad you listened to it today. Have a great week, guys. Bye.